welcome to episode 12 of the Ubuntu UK podcast with Simon, Tony, Laura, not Dave. Where's Dave then? Uh, having fun in Devon. What's the betting he's got a knotted hanky on his head? What's in the show this week? We've got an interview with Chris Jones from Canonical about his project Terminator. We've got an interview with Jeremy Allison from Samba. We're going to talk about um, training and certification. And we've got some news. And uh, feedback. And the results of the Vigland competition. And we've got this message from Dave. Sounds like a fun pack show. Uh, so Dave and myself are here at uh, Lug Radio with Chris Jones, who works for Canonical. Hi, Chris. Hi. What, what One of your pet projects is Terminator, and that's a project you, you started over a weekend, wasn't it? Can you tell me a bit about that? What, what is sure. Um, Terminator is a terminal emulator. So if you use GNOME Terminal or Xterm or uh, Console in KDE, it's effectively the same as that. It's, it's a command line in a window. And... Uh, let me see, probably six years ago, I guess, maybe, GNOME 1 was around, and there was a really nice terminal emulator which let you split your window into a grid and align your terminals that way. And when the GTK 2 move happened for GNOME 2, that sort of got left behind, and they tried to forward port it, and it didn't have quite enough momentum to make it happen, and so it just disappeared into the background. Um, And instead, people used tabs, and I disagree with that because... If you've got your terminals in tabs, you can't see them all at the same time. And being a sysadmin, I need to see lots of things at the same time. I want to be watching ILC, talk to people. I want to be watching logs. I need to be actually you know, typing something, so I'm doing some work. Um, and I want to see those things at the same time. And so I ended up with a, a myriad of windows scattered around all over the desktop, and it was a pain to organize. So I thought, I must be able to solve this, and uh, hacked up some Python over a weekend. Okay, s- since release, what new features have you actually added to that? So something we're working on at the moment is the ability to type into multiple terminals at once. So you'd be able to select a group of terminals, say you you SSH to all of your web servers. You select those terminals as a group, type into one of them, and what you type is is echoed to all of them, so you can run the same commands everywhere. What's the the main use case that that you have? Because you're a developer, you're scratching an itch. There's clearly something you want this to do for. Well, um, actually, interestingly enough, this isn't a feature that I've created. Um, and it actually, I would go further than that and say it's not something I would use, simply because I need to be very careful with what I'm doing. And there are systems like this, so there's something called cluster SSH, which lets you execute commands on multiple SSH sessions. They are very useful. And if you had a pool of you know, hundreds or thousands of machines that were identical, and you can guarantee that they are identical, that kind of thing is, is very useful. I tend to favor, in environments which aren't like that, actually doing things by hand because you, know, you only need one subtle little difference somewhere and everything just goes catastrophically wrong. Um, but it's a feature that other people have asked for and somebody came forward with a branch and so we're working on tidying that up to get it included in the next release. I mean, I, I could certainly think of a, a use case for that. Um, if you want to upgrade multiple servers at the same time or even um, one which doesn't have danger um, if you wanted to grep multiple logs and then you could view logs of of what you're actually looking for um, so I can certainly use, use feature that now the thing is that isn't in the actual one which is in the repositories at the moment if I wanted to run a more recent one how would I do that we keep all of our um, code in launchpad so you can go to our project page on launchpad which is launchpad.net slash terminator uh, and in the code section there's a simple little command you can run which will pull out the latest uh, version from BZR, um, and you can run it straight from that directory, and you'll get the current, what we're working on right now, bleeding edge kind of version. Might be broken. Yeah, um, we, we try to keep the, the trunk, as it's called, in, in good shape, because most of us run directly from that. So any bugs in that that are really horrific tend to get fixed quickly because it stops us doing our work. Now, other than the obvious term, uh, how did you actually think of the name? I don't know. I like giving things interesting names from a, a kind of sideways angle, which some people approve of and some people don't. So basically, I was just trying to find something which sounded a bit like Term, and, and Terminator was, was came to mind. Um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. We have a, a small controversy about that at the moment. When I picked the name, I looked around Fresh Meat and GNOME Files and Launchpad and all of the indexes I could think of for free software, and I couldn't find another project with the same name. So I thought, great, the name's free. I'll use that. And it subsequently turns out that there is another terminal emulator called Terminator, which is written in Java. And it's quite an old project, and they've been around, I think they've been around for seven years or something. They don't really do very much advocacy of themselves, so I didn't come across them. And we're now stuck in this interesting situation of whether we should rename ourselves or just ignore them. 
your package is in the Ubuntu repository as Terminator. So if you went into Synaptic and, and you know, installed, you'd, you'd find it as Terminator. But their application is what? A, a separate download that's not in repository. So it's, it's not surprising you didn't find it. Yeah, I mean, looking f- at their project, I, I've no, never actually run it, but it seems like they haven't done a great deal of, of advocacy about their project. So it's not listed anywhere else. It's not, as far as I can tell, in any distributions. I, I struggle to even find a version number for it. I, I, it seems to be a small group of people who wanted this thing and created it for themselves and kept it to themselves. Have you contacted them about it? No. Are you going to contact them about it? Um, I'm in two minds about this. I, I'm really torn as to what we should do about this. I don't want to change the name because we've started to build up a little bit of momentum and people are reading about us and hearing hearing the name. But at the same time, I, I don't want to trample all over them. So I'm trying to weigh up whether we should just default to the good position of, of switching our name or look at the fact that they're not really promoting themselves and assume that they don't care. Have you had many suggestions for a new name? None at all. <laughs> Terminator 2? <laughs> All right, I didn't really think that was a serious suggestion, but yes, we did get terminated too. <laughs> it's written in uh, Python. Is Python a language you, you tend to use for your own project, or is it something you pick just for this? Um, I use Python at the moment basically for everything. Um, I, I used to use C a few years ago, and it's, it's a nice language, but it's just you spend so much time doing all of the low-level bootstrapping stuff to make anything actually happen that I just get bored of it. Whereas with Python, um, I think... If you're writing Python reasonably well, you can get most sections of code doing something useful. There's very little you're doing which is bootstrapping other things. So almost everything you're doing is directly productive, and I I really enjoy that. So I use it a lot. Uh, But is it actually a terminal emulator from scratch, or have you based it on something like GNOME Terminal code base? So it's actually just a wrapper. Um, GNOME Terminal uses a GTK widget called VTE to do its terminals. Um, and we are reusing that widget through Python. So in terms of compatibility features of the actual terminal itself, um, it's pretty much exactly the same as GNOME Terminal, and we've done our best to to copy the way they work for things, and uh, so even so far as uh, if you use GNOME Terminal and you have a profile configured in that, we can take advantage of that directly and pull in the same settings because they map exactly to properties on this VTE widget. So we haven't had to write all of the horrific VT100 emulation. I, I don't even know how that stuff works, and, and frankly, I don't want to know. It, it offends me that we still have to describe terminals in terms of 30-year-old serial console machines. So I'd like to see that disappear, but I don't have any plans to do that. So you hope that everyone in the future just calls terminals Terminators? Is that what it is? You want your, your project name to be the ubiquitous name for terminals now, is that right? Well, we are the robot future of terminals. But I mean, I do genuinely think that at this point, nobody really is using serial consoles. And if they are, they're probably using fairly legacy systems and wouldn't care if we came along and wrote a final definitive terminal cap, which is the description of the terminal's capabilities, and agreed that this was how software terminals work from, for the rest of time. But um, it, it's the kind of thing that, you know, the current stuff just about works and no one has the motivation to sit down and, and get everyone to agree to do this. I, I did notice there was a Linux cap, wasn't there? Uh, and I don't understand how that can be different to what the previous standards are. So that would, I imagine, refer to the Linux console, which will have certain features and behaviours. And so a term cap describes to an application running inside the terminal what the terminal it's running inside of is capable of doing. So some of them, for example, uh, are able to draw simple graphics, so straight lines, arrows, that kind of thing. And it it can express that this is possible, or it can use um, color. Uh, Some old terminals have a a status line, which appears at the bottom that you can't type in, but information can be displayed in there. And so the applications use the term cat to figure out what what they can actually do. Well, one thing that interests me, how many active developers do you actually have working towards Terminator? That varies somewhat. Um, By no means just me. We have 10 people listed in our copyright file. Um, Some of those people just turned up and said, you know, here's a branch. We have applied it and they've been happy since and not done any further work. There are probably four of us who work on it actively all the way through and and look at each other's branches and attack bugs. And and, and that's brilliant for me. I, I can go to sleep and wake up in the morning, check my email. There's a bug report. Somebody's confirmed it. Somebody's sent a patch, somebody else has looked at the patch, applied it to the code, and closed the bug. And, and it's just done. I haven't had to do anything. It's brilliant. Do you suspect um, Terminator will ever become the default 
uh, terminal emulator in Ubuntu? I doubt it. I don't know. It's we would need to do a lot more work. So at the moment, we we do all of our configuration either by copying your GNOME terminal settings or by forcing you to edit a text file, which for the kind of people who are using it at the moment, that's not really a problem. But realistically, we would need m more of a graphical interface. I, I honestly don't know. I don't have any strong desires to push that. Although there are some, some smaller Linux distributions which have started using it. So Crunchbang, I think you guys talked to Crunchbang guy. Um, Phil Nubra, who actually reported the bug about the, uh, I think he reported or commented on the bug about the name of the product. Yeah, Phil, Phil's not the first person who's brought that up, but um, yeah, he, he discussed it widely on his blog. Thanks, Phil. Um, so, so yeah, I think he's made that the default in Crunchbang. There are even some people talking about maybe making it uh, replace XFCE's terminal, but um, I, I'm not, not particularly into the, the Zubuntu scene, so I don't know exactly what's going on with that. But yeah, I'd love to see that happen. Uh, I actually run uh, Terminator at home. One thing that I can't know, I don't know whether I should blame you, or sorry, your project, or I should blame IRSSI. Uh, if you resize too quickly, it induces a seg fault in IRSSI. Now, is that Terminator emulator's fault, or IRSSI for not handling it correctly? I suspect that's probably a bit of both. I also don't think we have a bug report about that. Have you found a bug, Dave? Listeners, by the time you hear this, there will be a bug report. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> IBM and Canonical have got together, and they're now going to be uh, shipping Ubuntu on their service. And Ubuntu are going to be shipping some IBM software like Lotus Symphony. Yes. What does that do? Fills up your memory. Maplin are selling a wacky Linux laptop based on the ARM processor for £170. It's tiny. And rather limited, have we seen? 128 <laughs> meg of RAM. Carphone and Warehouse are going one better and supplying one with Ubuntu, which they're giving away for free. Terms and conditions apply. Intel are going to make their own standalone video card chips with bonkers amount of CPU on them. Which means we should get 3D acceleration using the open source drivers. On the desktop. Wow. QAIQ are going to deliver official Ubuntu training in the UK. All that money you've saved on Windows licenses you can pay for training. Dell's announced that it's met its carbon neutrality goals early. Which seems to involve releasing a green laptop. Made of bamboo. Perhaps it will run bamboo too. I really want to do some, um, some training, some Linux training. Why training in particular? Well, because at some stage I may, in fact I will leave my current employer. And I'd like to work in computing in some way. You're a mad, mad fool. Yeah, I know. A lot of people sort of say, no, you don't want to do that. You want to stay in, in your field. So maybe, maybe some computing. Um, you, you think formal training is something you need to get that? That's a debate in itself. Um, well, no, it is. That's it, why we're talking about it. Yeah, I think it will help. If I've taught myself a lot of skills, an employer won't know what I'm capable of. So I need to get some sort of certification. A piece of paper I can wave in front of his face and say, there you go, look, there's my capability. That piece of paper says so. I'm not sure about that. I went for a job interview today and I have no certifications of any kind in the field that I'm currently working in, I don't think. Well, none that are current, anyway. But, but you have a lot of experience. Exactly. And so experience counts. Well, ex experience counts for a lot. Is training a replacement for experience? You've got to start somewhere. You now get employed on previous employers' recommendations. Initially, you must have had a foot in the door. Yeah, whilst that might be true, I didn't have any training before that. If you keep rewinding all the way back to the very, very beginning, it didn't start with having had training. But a lot more people are trying to get into computing jobs now. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I, I started from a point of already having some knowledge because I had a ZX81 in my kitchen and learned computers all for a very long time. So I had that as a head start. Whereas someone like yourself, Simon, who's, you know, qualified helicopter pilot which is completely nothing to do with you know computing yep 
you i don't know is that is that the best way to go is it best to take a training course take a certification exam and then write a cv that says i've taken this course i've done this exam i don't know i can look at it from my perspective i've got a team at work and i've employed people as part of that team and i know when i'm interviewing if somebody hasn't got a huge amount of experience a qualification will help just to show that they can actually apply themselves to a, a course of study and get something out of it at the end and it may be a differentiator between two candidates if they're you know of equal sort of skill and experience in, in, in all other measures if somebody's got a, a qualification, then it may just help tip the balance. So that's something else. That's that's a qualification. There's there's two things there. There's there's taking training courses, which you know Canonical have just announced these new training courses in the UK, the Ubuntu Professional Course. Is what, it good enough to attend a course, or do you have to attend a course and show the certificate to prove it? I've done about four weeks worth of training courses in Linux admin and things like that um, a couple of years ago, and obviously a lot of it I don't use day to day. If I were to do the say LPI exams now I'd have to do a fair amount of revision to get back up to scratch with them but I think it would be good to do the certification as a kind of prove that you've done that level and also it's an industry recognized one as opposed to I went on a training course at work kind of course. Yeah. Do you think that um, actually as individuals there's something to be said for it and that whilst we all dabble and, and get sometimes fairly deep with the computers going and do the um, one of the Ubuntu training courses is it going to teach you things that you don't currently know about? Yeah, almost certainly. I, I did the LPI level one certification, so there's two exams as part of that, and I did learn things that I didn't know. Arguably, there were things I didn't need to know anymore about how to configure ISA cards and things like that, and send mail. Well, I use a distribution that doesn't use send mail as the default mail server, so what do I care about configuring send mail? But there were still things in it that I picked up and that I remembered and have actually come in handy as well. So it wasn't just a case of going over things I already knew just to get a piece of paper. It did teach me stuff. Isn't the, the, the fact that you don't use send mail just because you're using the other distribution? Because you're using Debian and LPI, yeah. LPI is supposed to be Debian and Red Hat cover like enough topics of both. Yeah, but, but for example, it doesn't cover uh, in huge detail Exim and Postfix. The mail server it talks about most is SendMail and it doesn't cover CUPS in huge detail. It covers the old print system. Is that not just because it's old? It's not I, been, I, I, I suspect The exam's so, yeah. not been updated recently. Yeah, I suspect so. But so. it gives you uh, a broad and uh, deep knowledge of Linux as a whole. So that's got to be a good thing. Broad, yes, yeah. deep. Hmm. It does expect you to have um, experience of more than one distribution as well. So you can't get away with just doing Debian-based system. You need to know a bit about RPM-based systems. And Is that a good thing? I yes. think it's good for showing that you've got that breadth of knowledge. And, and also you're not corporates. Just Ubuntu. Your average corporate, most of them actually use Red Hat-derived distributions like Red Hat or you know, SUSE for another option. Like every, every customer that I've been to in the last few years, if they use Linux, it's Red Hat. Or SUSE. None of them I've been to recently have used uh, Debian or Ubuntu, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I use Debian and Ubuntu at work, but... Um, that's because you installed it. That's because I installed it, and, you know, the, the pressure is always there to get Linux packages on uh, Red Hat and SUSE. But the reason that I like the LPI system is because it's not specific to a distribution. Saying that you've got a Red Hat certification, it's well re respected, but it's all Red Hat. Yeah, a lot of people think Red Hat is Linux. Is Linux. Um, it forms a base. And again, I, I suspect it's a base for your skills. It says, yeah, you've got a certain degree of skill in, in learning Linux. A lot of it will apply to other distributions and some of it won't, but you've obviously got the skill to study and learn should you need to learn a new distribution. So should we actually, I mean, you're already LPI one, aren't you, Tony? And Laura, you've done an LPI exam. Or no, I've you... not done an exam. I oh, okay. want to do the exam. You want to do the exam. Mm. And Simon, you want to I do I just it. want to do something. Something. So should we all commit to doing this together? No, what? Should I've we... got a book. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got a couple of books, and they're they're holding the door open quite nicely. Yeah. <laughs> they're big ones. Would that help us to like get motivated to do it if we're all doing it together? Or doing the Ubuntu well, certification? We'll start well, with the, level one. Yeah, I would start with level one, and then move on to the others, and do the Ubuntu certification at the end of it. Yeah. Does the Ubuntu course not include um, LPI one and LPI two before you do their Ubuntu? Exam. I thought it was just LPI 1. Yeah, I'm thinking more um, motivate us to do the exams rather than the courses. I mean, it's up to you if you want to do the course and you want to spend the money on, However you on the learn course, best, I guess. which is 1,500 quid for five days for course number one. No. Well, yeah, that's that exactly. So, well, you don't need to because you've already got LPI 1, haven't you? I studied for it myself in my own time and didn't have to go on a very expensive residential course to you did the assessment at the Linux World Expo. Yeah, I went to the expo where there was a discount on the exam, so I got did the exam for half price. I think it was sort of 20 quid or something like that. The other option is to do it uh, online, because Canonical have a, an online training system. So you can actually... I, I'm not sure if it does the professional course. We should talk to someone about this. Yeah, 
Who can we ask about it? Canonical. <laughs> We'd probably be the best people. <laughs> okay. Let's get them on next time then. So uh, Dave, Tony and uh, me here with uh, Jeremy Allison from the Samba Project. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Pleased to meet you. Um, we, we kind of um, use Samba probably without knowing it and a lot of people have installed in their system without. Can you tell us you know, what it does and what it gives us? Sure. Uh, Samba is one of those interesting things. It, it's quite old. It's actually older than the Linux kernel itself as a project. Uh, it's probably easier to describe Samba uh, in terms of the, uh, for Windows users. So if you're used to using Windows. So imagine you're, you're on your Windows box and you click on um, Network Neighborhood and you see a bunch of machines in the network neighborhood, servers and printers and whatever, and you can attach to them. And, you know, they're across the network, they're not local to your machine. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, Samba is software that runs on Linux and other Unixes that allows a Linux or Unix machine to appear as though it were a Windows server. So it can appear on a network neighborhood. It can, you know, you would see a, a Linux box as though it were a Windows server. Uh, and in fact, uh, many people just don't, they use Samba every day and they, they don't know that that's what they're using because it looks to them like it's a, a Windows server, um, you know, and they just access it from their Windows box. So I, I like to describe it as the glue that binds Linux and Windows together. And it can be in uh, non-Windows environments as well, like um, like embedded devices as well all over the place, isn't it? Yeah, uh, a lot of embedded devices, remember them, their main market is to connect to Windows users because that's the, the dominant client. So a lot of embedded devices use Samba as software that they put on their device and that allows them to connect to Windows clients. But the nice thing about modern Linux desktops is that they also have client software that allows them to connect to Windows or Samba servers so that they can participate. If you're running GNOME, say, a standard Ubuntu load, and you click on the, what is it, the mic places, yeah, um, you can see w the Windows network is one of your choices, and then that's using the Samba libraries on the client to go out and look for either Windows or Samba servers. And that the goal is that you don't know the you don't know which is which, and you don't have to care. Now, I've set Samba up on servers and things at work and used it for file storage, but is is it uh, really a useful technology for getting Linux machines to talk to each other? Um, and where I've done it before, it's been Linux on the server, Windows clients. Um, but you know, does it apply in other situations as well? Macs, for example. Well, that's that's the common um, that's the common scenario is Windows clients, Linux servers, because that's what most people have. But increasingly. Yeah, Macs also have uh, uh, what's called SIFS, that's the protocol, Common Internet File System. They have a client built in. Um, it, I actually know the guy who wrote it, works at Apple, lives not too far from me. And that's being maintained by Apple. And now Linux also has a SIFS client built into its kernel, done by a guy, Steve French, who lives in Austin, who works for IBM. And also Jeff Layton at, Ray, Ray, at Red Hat. And those guys develop that. Uh, and so the protocol that Samba uses, which is SIFS, We've actually extended it. Um, we've added extensions that Microsoft don't support. They're, they're aware of them and they're, you know, they're happy to leave us to extend that area. And what that allows Linux to Samba and Mac to Samba to do is it allows you to get the complete Unix experience, not just sort of the Windows experience. And it's a little difficult to describe exactly what that is without really diving into inc some incredibly technical details, which I'm happy to do, but I don't want to really bore all your listeners with, with POSIX file locking, access control mechanisms, you know, the differences in open semantics between Windows and Linux, but th those are the kind of things that we have to cope with um, when we're servicing Linux clients rather than Windows clients. And that can only apply when it's Linux to Linux, because the Windows machines don't understand it. So it's not like you're excluding them, it's just making use of extra technology. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it, what happens is when they first connect, you negotiate a dialect that you're going to speak, and there's a separate dialect that the Linux and Mac clients speak that actually has the extensions that, that they need uh, as opposed to the ones that Windows use. I'm wondering, is one of the features you've added uh, file permission ownership? Um, so, so the interesting thing about that is um, Windows to Windows also has file permissions and ownership because if you're used to using sort of... Uh, standard commercial desktops, you can right click on a file, get properties, and it'll show you who owns it and the permissions. But those are very Windows centric ones. So we actually have a, an emulation layer in Samba that will take Unix permissions and map those into Windows uh, ownership and permissions. 
But if you're using Linux to Linux, you obviously you don't want to go through the translation layer only to have it translated back. So when you're doing Linux to Linux or Mac to Linux, you can connect directly and we'll give you the raw POSIX, you know, the Unix information directly to the client. So you can see exactly the user ID and group ID of who owns it and what permissions they have. I mean, as I understand it, I mean, Samba's constantly trying to uh, follow the Microsoft, the, the, the way the actual project of that is going. Well, they keep changing it, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> and is, that, is that one of the major issues for the, the Samba project, is keeping up? Um, in, in some ways. I mean, every new release, version, every new version of Windows that comes out has new stuff in there. Um, then we then we invented a whole new protocol level called SMB2 that we're going to start emulating. Hopefully by the end of this year we're going to start coding on that, um, putting it into production quite soon. We've got an experimental um, version of that already working. Yeah, I mean, they, they do change it very rapidly. They're trying to keep Windows adding more and more things. But the most useful thing that's happened recently is after the European Union case, Microsoft now documents everything. Um, it's not complete yet. It's not... You know, it, it, it's better than the, the original uh, stuff that we had, which was very poor, but it's still not as complete as we'd like it to be. So we're actually helping them do that. And uh, that was the case where a couple of months ago they had to actually open their standard, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they, they did do that. Yeah, they, they still claim it's covered by patents, but other than that, they've documented everything. And has that, has that actually helped you so far, the stuff they've opened up already, or is it still a long way off the documentation that you need, or, or do you already kind of know that kind of stuff? A, a lot of the stuff we already know, and, and some of the things, essentially they've come to us and says, this, this is the documentation that we think is right, will you help us <laughs> make it match reality? Well, you see, the, the problem is we've been doing this work for you know, about 16 years, and, and the people who originally did that work in Microsoft have long since left, so they've inherited a legacy code base that they're trying to document. Um, but actually, yeah, the documentation has significantly helped. Samba 3.2 works better with Windows 2008 and Vista Service Pack 1 because of the documentation. There were some essential features that we found in there that helped us in, in preparing the Samba 3.2 release, which is our latest. You mentioned uh, Samba, a later version, Samba 3.1, 3.2, and obviously people who've got uh, systems that already installed will have older versions of Samba. Are there challenges that in some way you can help the distributions, uh, or is there any way in which you can help the distributions, um, given that they're now possibly out of date and can't keep up with the protocols as they're changing and that kind of thing? Is that something you can help with? Yeah, it's the same problem that Firefox has moving from Firefox 2 to Firefox 3. I mean, we produce the code, we make sure it compiles on all Linuxes uh, and it's available for all distributions. And actually, you can download packages directly from the Samba site. But obviously, that's probably for more advanced users who want to replace the packages that are on their own distributions. What, what is a lot easier for people is to wait until the distributions pick the packages up. Um, and integrate them into their, you know, into their schedule. But obviously that means that the various distributions are always just a little bit behind. Uh, and, that, and that's just a tension between the development and the, you know, the distribution. There's, no, there's nothing we can really do t to help that because we don't have the resources to package up and test for every single distribution out there. And the distros have to, you know, have to maintain some stable ABIs for various commercial products. And so, I mean, we try and keep everything as stable as possible, but yeah, we really, we really have to trust the distributions to do their own QA and decide when something is ready to push out to, to everyday users. So from a user's perspective where they've, they've installed Ubuntu or whatever flavor and, and they try to connect to a relatively new server or, and, you know, it doesn't work, it's, it's not necessarily that, you know, none of this works, it's, it's kind of... They're just in that kind of stuck area where they can't get well, the new version, perhaps. Or. Yeah, then, yeah, that, that essential. But that's the same problem that Microsoft has, where a bunch of things didn't work with Vista because <laughs> they changed them. So it's, you know, that's what happens when you change stuff all the time. The, the latest version of Ubuntu has a version of Samba that I think works well with all versions of Windows, you know, Windows 2003, XP, all service packs or whatever. It, it's only if you're wanting to connect to Windows 2008 or, you know, you've got a latest service pack release of Vista that you might need to update the version of Samba that comes on the distribution at that point. In terms of Samba 4, um, it's going to, or the, one of the objectives is to implement a full Active Directory stack so it can be a domain controller. Yeah. Um, that's obviously great for server admins. 
and people who want to run Linux servers instead of Windows servers. What sort of impact do you think it will have on the Linux desktop, the work that's going into Sam before? Not much, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, so the Linux desktop really needs, um, you know, what the Linux desktop uses is the client pieces. So um, there's a couple of things um, that actually the desktop uses. So need one is the ability to connect to any Samba or Windows server out there, uh, or NetApp or EMC or the others that also support this protocol. And for that, you need a stable set of client libraries, which we already have. Samba 4 won't really change that. The other thing that you need is, uh, and that desktop users quite like, is if they're used to Windows, what they'd like to do is to navigate to a directory, right-click on the directory and say, share this directory to people. Now, that, what that entails, that's much more complex than it appears because at that point, what you actually have to do is to start a Samba server on your machine. If you already have Samba set up as a server on that box, um, I know that um, OpenSUSE does this because we integrated this while I was there. You can right click on something and it will create shares if there's a running Samba service. I'm not, I believe that Ubuntu does the same. I haven't played with that. There is a box that comes up and says you need to install. I think it does, ah, it okay. gives you two options for Samba or NFS and yeah. I think you'd say yes I want Samba. But the, the issue is when you do that you're installing a server um, and that's not terribly obvious. The reason that it works seamlessly on Windows is that they're, they're running that server all the time, which Ubuntu and many of the Linuxes don't do, because to be honest, if you don't need that service, it's a security hole to have it running when, when you're not using it. When you're running on the desktop, are some of the problems to do with the fact that it's a text-based configuration file? Because when you configure Samba 3 at the moment, it's all, you know it's, it's editing smb.conf, which is fine on the server, and if you're a sysadmin, you, can get, you get on with it. Integrating that sort of click and click and play functionality into the desktop must be a challenge, but also the more advanced stuff in Samba 4, where you're trying to do group policies and, and things like that, administering that from a GUI is the sensible way to do it. I would have thought. Are there any pl any plans to go there? That, that direction? Well, so so as for administering things with a GUI, to be honest, and uh, unfortunately this is true, uh, we tend to support the Microsoft tools running on Windows clients rather than because that's the majority use case. The text-based configuration in Samba 3, a lot of the distros are very smart about being able to right-click and say, hey, I'm setting up a Samba service, and they have a little configuration, GUI configuration tool that will create a base, basic version of that text file for you. Now, one of the things that we've added in Samba 3.2, Michael Adams of CERNET did this, is the ability to migrate uh, an smb.conf text file into let's just call it what it is, a registry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Windows users will be delighted. Uh, Unix users, maybe not so much. But yeah, it's a binary uh, configuration file. And at that point, all you have to do is to have a minimal smb.conf that essentially says include registry configuration. And at that point, everything is pro programmatically controlled by writing into a registry. So I'm hoping that that will make a difference. The, the other thing that we added was in, an, in the later Samba 3.0s, at least for adding shares, is the ability to do something that I called user shares, which, because right now, editing smb.conf, you have to be root, you have to have admin privileges because it's a security sensitive file. So, obviously, I didn't want people to have to have set UID binaries for when you right click and say, I want to share this directory. So what I created was something called user shares, uh, which allows text-based files containing shared descriptions to be written by non-privileged users. And then Samba, in an incredibly paranoid way, because I had to write all that code, will read those files. And if they make sense, it will create shares on behalf of that user uh, and actually share it out as though it, as though it were added to smb.com. Uh, now, you actually have a, um, a HTTP website configuration tool, don't you? Uh, how is that coming? Is that going to be working with, um, with version 4 as well? So the web configuration tool is called SWAT Samba Web uh, Administration Tool. Uh, tool. Uh, it, we actually broke it in straight, straight 3.2 because it's a little embarrassing, but none of the Samba team actually used that. Um, but uh, somebody did point that out to me as a fairly urgent bug. Um, and the 3.2.1 release, which hopefully will be out by the time you <laughs> hear this podcast, <laughs> fingers crossed, uh, will uh, we'll fix that issue. Um, we're Going, trying to go to time-based releases, our goal is to have a new release out every six months and, and try and follow the Ubuntu model, because that's working really well. 
Is that to specifically fit in with this idea of regular release cycles that Gnome do and that KDE might try and get towards? It, it was actually driven... Sambury, Sambury's most used... I know it's used a lot on Linux, um, my sort of regular Linux users, but our primary users, the, the people who hit the most basically the most bang for the buck, the most users we get, are actually OEMs who integrate it into network attached storage devices. There's a lot of those out there. I, I commonly say that if you go into an electronic shop and you see a network attached storage and it's under $10,000, it's Linux and Samba inside. Um, and, and so the reason that we went to six monthly base releases really was because our OEMs um, were saying, look, we need consistency, we need you know, it, th those essentially are the customers that we were trying to uh, we were trying to please at that point. Um, so some of the weird things that you might see in Sam, it's like, well, why did they do that? That might not make specific sense for a Linux distro. A lot of that is driven by the OEM, who are our real customers, as it were. You mentioned um, security. You know, it's it's something that's uh, on the network. It's something that's. You know, it's an open port or ports, yeah. and uh, and so you know it's it's going to be vulnerable to attack. So how do you, how do you deal with those kind of issues? Well, it depends how bad the issues are. <laughs> um, so we over the years we've learned to be paranoid about incoming traffic. No one is ever paranoid enough, uh, especially with a protocol that's as complex as this. Um, not only do you have to watch for the standard silly things like buffer overruns, denial of service attacks. Uh, there are much more subtle things like um, the, the latest sort of security fad, uh, well, fad is the wrong word, um, the latest security threat that we've had to audit for is integer wrap. And this is something that y you don't often think about um, when you're programming, but when you're multiplying two numbers together, um, if you've got, you know, you have a fixed width data type, uh, the machines are 32 or 64 bit. If an attacker is clever enough in an incoming packet and they can get you to multiply two of those numbers together, you can end up with a very small number. So imagine that, uh, and this, this is the way that the attacks go, imagine that you can fool a server into multiplying elements of a, a packet together to decide how much memory space it has to allocate. So you multiply the two together, you end up with a small number, you allocate 1K or whatever, and then you look at how much you actually read in, and you look at those two big numbers that you were using to multiply, and you overrun significantly. And, and many network services have had issues like that. In fact, that's very common, and that's a very common attack on, on a great deal of software. Because back when this stuff was written, and remember, Samba is 15, 16 years old now, uh, back when a lot of this stuff was written, no one ever imagined those attacks. I mean, these are reasonably modern attacks. So do you have a, a, a team or, or a group of people who, who look after security in Sambor? Is it just like any other open source project? You know, lots of contributors, or is it a fairly closed environment? How does, how does that work? So we, we have quite a few contributors. Um, there are three or four people who are, although we're not security experts, we take care of the security in Samba, and we've had enough problems that we are sensitive to the kind of things that go wrong. In addition to that, this is where the vendors do help a great deal. The vendor security teams audit Samba. So we've been audited by Suzy, by Red Hat, um, by Debian, you know, and occasionally they point out bugs that we've missed. Mostly it's they haven't found bugs because we either found them first or, you know, customers have, or the, some of the security uh, firms. Oh, the, the other people who audit Samba are the security researchers. Uh, they love mining Samba to try and find problems. So uh, we actually have a lot of um, we have a lot of QA that's done on Samba. We have an automated system that's run by a company called Coverity that does static analysis, um, and uh, they have a very expensive tool actually. Because I was I felt kind of bad being a charity case and getting them to run it on us for free. So I said, oh, you know, how much would it be to buy? And the answer really was, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually run um, they run this every week on the Samba code base um, and it, it finds bugs and I mean not only security bugs because you know as Linus said security bugs are just a special case of bugs but it, it finds bugs and it, it finds you know memory leaks in error cases which are very common and you know it, it's basically improving our code quality when they first ran against us they found 253 issues I think which we fixed in two weeks and that was, none of them were security late, related, although some of them were uh, the occasional crash bug, which, you know, you could cause a denial of service. And now we're at level two. Um, so basically, they, as they keep improving their static analyzer, they keep ratcheting up 
the uh, level of analysis they do on the Samba code and we keep fixing the bugs and and the other thing is we keep feeding back to them the reason they do it is we feed back to them when their analyzer finds false positives uh, so we're good at saying no you flag that as an error but it really isn't if you look at this condition and then they will go back and improve their analyzer for their commercial customers so you've worked for a number of big open source companies and things in the past and hardware vendors and things now you're at Google mm -hmm. what do Google need with a Samba developer I could tell you that, but then I would have to kill you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's only between us three. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. But no, I, um, so, so Google's interested in, in a lot of, of technology. No, I mean, Google, Google does use Samba internally. Um, they have some products that, that use Samba. Um, sort of Google has some infrastructure that you know, I'm, I'm planning to help replace with, with Samba servers. Uh, and the other thing is I, I do... Um, I, I, I'm part of the open source programs office at Google, which actually helps us bring open source into the company and also to release open source because Google actually releases a great deal of source code. I mean, we recently released protocol buffers. And so I've, I've been on the open source review board of, of different companies of HP and Novell. There is no open source review board at Google. So this is things that people don't often realize. At Google, an engineer says, you know, I'd really like to open source this code. And so there's basically there's a, a process that goes through a patent review because unfortunately we live in a world with evil software patents. There's a patent review. There's a, you know, if they want to create a project with a certain code name, there's a trademark review. And then they're done. And then it's out the door. Uh, and, they, you know, and they get to choose the license. So Google's preferred license is Apache, but if it makes sense for it to LGPL or GPL3 or you know, just BSD, then the engineer really gets to choose what they want. And um, the, the, I think the fastest they've ever open sourced something, I believe, was a day. It was either a day or an afternoon. Somebody sort of came in the morning and it was out by the afternoon. And it was it's, it's an unbelievably streamlined process. So it works really well. If you want to get involved in Samba development, samba-technical at samba.org is the right place. If you want to discuss usage cases and you know sort of report bugs that may end up being development issues, the right place is samba at samba.org. Thanks very much, Thank Jerry. Oh, no problem. Thanks a lot. It's been a Thank lot you. of fun talking. Thank you. In the last episode, we uh, started a competition to give away the Viglin MPC-L that we reviewed. Um, cute little itsy bitsy sweeter sugar equal PC as it's been called by one of our listeners and um, we got uh, quite a few entries um, what did we ask what was the question we just wanted to know what you do with it basically it's a very small little system and uh, with a reasonably limited hardware so there was quite niche uses for it you couldn't really use it as a mainstream desktop so we wanted to know what you would put it to use as Owen Hopkins wants to take one of these great little PCs and uh, hook it up to his bike, his motorbike. He's got a CBR600 and use it as um, an intelligent uh, telemetry um, recording device. Mick says he would give it to his five-year-old daughter as he didn't win the Wraith competition. Aww. <laughs> Matt Jones would use it as a temperature monitoring device. Tim Waters, or Chippy as he's known, uh, would like to use one as a small server with uh, IRC and instant messaging on it. Niels Hansen wants to use it as a nifty little living room music server stroke player. David Fuchsia would use it uh, either as a dedicated server for Ubu Land, which is his project for free web hosting to members of the Ubuntu and free software community, or as a, a build server. I'm not too sure a build server is a clever idea for a thing that's got a processor that you can fit in a matchbox. Um, or hosting personal websites or as a Myth TV box. Gordon Allett wants to use it as a specy emulator. That's a good idea. I like that. Dead Rabbit wants to use it as a Myth TV thin client, which it might struggle a bit on some video, I guess, but mm. worth a try. Matt Dorman, wants to use his uh, very rather novel setup to uh, launch USB-controlled um, webcam missiles. Webcam, what? <laughs> 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 launch, oh, webcam. launch webcams. That could be expensive. <laughs> Matt McMillan will either put it in his car as an entertainment system or put it in the lobby of a hotel he's involved with. Albert Hickey would show how you can run Ubuntu on limited hardware and actually be useful, so that you don't need a big powerful box to do email, web and word processing. Bill Day wants to put it in his school to um, introduce uh, young students to Ubuntu and free software. Todd wants to use it as an IP cop bot. James Barr would use it in his kitchen as a sort of web surfing and email machine. And Laura Barr would use it as a music server. Andy Barr wants to use it for uh, off-site storage at his parents' house. 
Do we think that Andy Barr, Laura Barr and James Barr are all the same person? <laughs> Maybe related. Maybe they all listen together. We are a family show. Jason Licorice wants to use it in the kitchen as an electronic cookbook. Andy Stanford Clark said he'd use it to replace a couple of laptops in his home automation system, thus dramatically reducing the amount of electricity I use to run a system which helps reduce the amount of electricity I use. Get that. <laughs> My head. Hurts. He's far too brainy. John Constable would use it as a home network hub, or he quite likes the IP cop idea too. Ian Pascoe came up with quite a few ideas, including model rocket navigation system, uh, wireless access point and home automation hub. Jam Richter said uh, that they'd use it in a primary school as a primary school teacher's uh, computer. An entity known only as Quovmo said he or she would use it as a home security centre with a webcam and motion and stuff. James Eaton from New Zealand uh, said he would use it as a web server for his home network. Henrik Emblom from Sweden said he was going to use it to play Creative Commons licensed music out on his local community radio station overnight, thereby helping reducing licensing costs for them. Good idea. Yeah, cool. really good. Chris Nicholson said he'd use it as a media box for playing audio through his AV receiver and TV, so radio streams, podcasts, music, etc., but hook up a Nintendo Wii controller to it for a literal point-and-click interface. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's quite I cool. I like that one. Yeah. John Washington's going to set it up in his wife's lobby area with a flat screen um, so that it's on all the time, and that way she can't use a laptop, which dual boots XP and Ubuntu, so that she can only use Ubuntu. Tony Equi is going to use it as a nice lightweight web browser instead of the um, four gig um, power hungry monster that he currently uses. Christopher Jensen says he's going to hook it to a Drobo and develop Linux utilities for it. Hmm, that sounds handy, doesn't it, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> Ted Bullock says he's going to turn it into some sort of lathe control mechanism. Well, I think there was a whole router router mistranslation going on I there. I think so. It's crazy Canadians. Mm. James Hartland wants to use it as a BitTorrent server so that he can share out the ISO images and thus contribute to the community. Robbie Murray would put it in his child's room um, because it would be perfect for playing music and stories which are on the home server. Oh, and as the child gets older, he could use it himself as a thin client. Adam Spain says he'd set it up as an IPv6 endpoint. So geek points to you there. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we pick a winner? Yep, those are some really great entries. Um, but we've selected one at random and the winner is... Matt Daubney. Congratulations, Matt. With his missile launching, thing, the webcam launching thing. Yeah, yeah, launching missiles from a USB missile launcher at people who come in the door if Excellent. they haven't got an RFID tag on them. Excellent. Cool. Hopefully we'll get some uh, pictures and um, a follow-up to his use of the uh, Viglin. Yeah, you see, what you don't realise, Matt, is that you actually have to build this now, yeah. officially, and send us photos in, otherwise we send Mark Shuttleworth around. We look forward to it. <laughs> We've got another competition uh, this episode for one of the canonical store vouchers. Yes, where you can get all sorts of T-shirts and pens and badges and widgets and support contracts. Support contracts. Everything Training. Ubuntu related. All for Ubuntu stuff. So what's the question? In this show, we interviewed Jeremy Allison from the Samba Project. Mm -hmm. Who started the Samba Project? Email your answers to us at competition at ubuntu-uk.org by the 20th of August. OK, here's the feedback from our last episode. Yeah, Wayne Hamilton emailed in, remember we talked about watching TV and video on Linux? Yeah. Um, he emailed in saying he uses MeTV, um, which none of us here had heard of before, but we Googled it up, and it's at me-tv.sourceforge.net, and it's a sort of GNOME GTK TV application. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, some of the features it's got in it are quite advanced as well. Yeah, you can record TV programs, you can watch them. And it's got a program guide as well. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're interested in it, check it out. Um, also, I discovered after the um, the episode where we talked about TV, um, there's a thing called Swarm Player. It's like really early alpha version of this peer-to-peer -peer type transmission system for sending programs. Around. Apparently the BBC are involved in its development. But, uh, yeah, it looks quite cool. At the moment, all you can see is the view of a webcam. It's somewhere in Scandinavia. But, yeah, they're working on it. And there's a Linux version. We previously mentioned uh, Best Buy selling Ubuntu. And uh, Mish contacted us and said that it's not just a CD that you buy. Ah, right, okay. Because we'd sort of said, what's the point in buying the CD for $20 when you can download it? Yeah, sure. Well, apparently you also get two months of support from Canonical. Two months for, what, $20? $20, I think what's it that, was. that, £10? Yeah. Yep. Yep. £10 for two months of phoning up Kurt of the Canonical support team. That's got to be worth £10 of anyone's money. Definitely. Benjamin Webb says that the MP3 version of the podcast 
um, doesn't play properly on his player. Um, we welcome feedback like that, but please tell us which player and point us to podcasts that do work so we can fix it. Yeah, or even better still, send us one of the players. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, everyone. Uh, even if it. it does work on your player, perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Send us your player. Yes. <laughs> if you do have a player that is playing up, we do want to help you fix uh, the podcast so you can listen to it because we have had a report of an OG player as well, I think, that wasn't quite working with one of the OG versions. But we obviously haven't got all these things um, to test them on. So get in touch with us. And uh, particularly if you can tell us, as I say, Laura said, what podcasts do work on your player so we can go away and steal their settings. That would be great. Russian Rutter asked us to talk about backups. Um, and Time Machine. Oh, uh, yeah. I think he wanted like a Time Machine equivalent for Linux or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's two. Okay. Um, now, we had a other requests, I think, for backup talk mm. as well, didn't we? Something we'll probably have to talk about in a future episode. Yeah, it's quite a big topic. I think uh have a whole segment on that. Okay, so listen out for that one, I guess. Mm. It's the end. That's the end of episode 12. Popey, you wanted to say something about the Viglan thing. Ah, yes. Last episode, we gave away the details for how you can get one of those Viglian NPCs for only 80 quid, including VAT and delivery. And uh, I'll remind you what those details are. It's uh, if you email npc at viglian.co.uk and uh, tell them we sent you, you can get one of those little natty PCs quite cheap. Yeah, and uh, it also now seems to include a mouse and keyboard. And yeah, a, a there's Microsoft a Microsoft mouse, in fact. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a 10-day wait. I've ordered a couple, and uh, there was a bit of a glitch. Um, so if you have emailed and it, it seemed like they weren't willing to um, uh, accept the offer, then uh, that's just a glitch in communication within Biglin. You can email us, <laughs> podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can get us on Twitter, twitter.com slash UUPC, and of course now Identica, identity.ca slash UUPC. You can get our phone number from the website where you can leave us 30 seconds of voicemail. Or you can go on IRC at hash ubuntu-uk. And that's on the Freenode Network. Thank you for mentioning the IRC channel, Laura. We've added some basic instructions to the Contact Us page on our website. So if you don't know what IRC is and how to connect, uh, that should help. And we'd like to thank our mirrors, showmedo.com and bitfolk.com and all the other community mirrors as well. And next week we've got a special offer from Bitfolk. Mm. Yes. Let's keep listening for that special prize. That's it. Goodbye. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.